Hello there and welcome to Roll on the Adventure. We're taking a little break between acts this time and we're going to be answering questions from the internet. I've got Moly here with me. Hello, this is basically our Hot Springs episode. Yeah, um, I've had to extend the mic cable quite far to get it into the bath, <laughs> but it, it was totally worth it. <laughs> Please extend another cable for a toaster so you can, uh, <laughs> you can have a swim with it. Please. Oh, man. I don't want to get the toaster in the bath. My bread will get wet. <laughs> of course, yes. That's the bigger concern. But yes, so are we going to sing the intro or? I'm, I don't know. Have we done the, I can't remember if we've done intros for the uh, inter, inter, yeah, in, intermissions. That's the let's, one. Let's go with no. This is the hot spring episode. Let's go with, yeah, yeah. Let's go. Roll, Roll on, on the adventure. The adventure. That's, that'll do. There we go. Yeah, we're done. Okay. So our first question is from Rob, and this is an interesting one. Uh, Rob asks, can a bard be mute and still cast using sign language? I'm going to guess this, this is a D&D 5e question. Yeah. So technically, like rules readers written, no, because spells have a verbal component and you cannot cast a spell without a verbal component. Rule of cool? I probably wouldn't allow sign language, but I would allow, like, you know, using your musical instrument to kind of, quote, unquote, oh. create your voice. Oh, and yeah, I mean, does the uh, Kenku have that mimic ability that they can only talk through that? I hate that. Like, a Kenku bard would be doing that, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, So yeah, where's exactly. the difference? Like, yeah, pretty much, pretty much, I'll give you that. Um, my only concern, like because I'm a horrible person, my only concern is the reason why you want to make a mute spellcaster is to get round the fact that you have to, you know, yell nonsense in order to... Yeah, totally. And to cast it makes spell. it very obvious what you're doing. Yeah, whereas if you can just quietly do, you know, the old Naruto fingers, yeah, um, you know, it, it just feels a bit kind of cheap. Yeah. But then again, it depends on the player. You know, I've got players I've played with for years who I would, I would trust. Yeah, like I'd do it with a home group. Probably, yeah, but not not a convention or for Marlon Rando. Nah, I don't think I would. Mainly, just like you say, it's there's too much that they could be trying to get round. Exactly. But the right player in the right in like a home group, I I I'd, I'd allow it. I think. Yeah. Yeah, it it'd be fun, you know. Um, it would be interesting. Oh man, but the, if the bard's whole thing is mime. <laughs> Mimes. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, there was a variant bardic class in Monty Cook's Arcana and Earth, which was the was the mime, and that was that does not surprise me at all. Yeah, it was kind of cool in that um, you could still speak and make noise and all that nonsense, but uh, if you did, you lost your mime abilities for until you've been oh, silent wow. for twenty four hours. Twenty four hours. Yeah, I mean, because it's it's Monty Cook, so it's going to be yeah. brutal. But it was just—I thought that was quite clever. That it's like you can shout, "Look out!" If you yeah. have to. I suppose now it'd be until that you've completed a short rest or a long rest or whatever. Yeah, I'd probably go for short. They didn't really have short, did they back then? So but it was like what five minutes? You know, you'd either have a five-minute rest or an eight-hour rest. That was about it. Yeah, there weren't many things that really pegged off the five-minute rest, though, were there? Oh, yeah, that's a good point. No, not really. Fourth edition really bigged up the short rest. Yeah, thing, but... like I know it mostly from Thirteenth Age. So... Yeah, which again was st stole it from fourth. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think the first one to do it was um, Iron Heroes or Star Wars Saga Edition. I think oh, they right. were the first. One or the other of them was the first one to introduce that concept. You know. Yeah, but, I liked yeah. what. I liked what Fourth did with it and sort of broke it away from the, like time completely. Yeah, it's I just rather like, like that. Yeah, you kind of have a fag break and then, right, let's get back to it. Yeah. Uh, whereas, yeah, the rules in, in Fifth, I'm kind of irked that they put it back to being time. Constrained. The one that the one that got me actually, uh, I found this out from running Adventure League. A short rest is an hour, mm. and like that's that's a long time in game. Like, particularly because I'm running the Adventure League for um, Dragon Heist Season 8. Yeah. And some of that is very time sensitive. So, like, your players just don't get to have a break. And it it really affects, like, their 
I won't say their judgment, but it affects mm. how they go after things. You know, they suddenly yeah. are like, oh, no, no, we can't rest. We have to just power on through. And it's like, well, you guys are kind of messed up. Yeah, yeah, but we don't want to miss the chance to do X, you know? I'd, I'd like that, though. I think the idea of having a choice of do you want to do X or take a short rest is a good thing. Mm, I think the problem, at least my players have been having, is that they, they're concerned that if they miss X, that's it. Yeah. You know. I mean, that can be a real question. I think that's yeah. it's good, but I think it's also a technique that you probably should be using quite sparingly. Yeah, and I think that's the problem. It, it feels a bit indiscriminate, you know. But no, that's a genuinely good question. Right, yeah. so cool. the next question is from Sarah. Sarah? Sarah? I'll go with Sarah, because no H. Uh, yeah. <laughs> how do you get a non-role player to start role-playing and when the rest of the group does? Ah, uh, oh, see, this is a this is a tricky one to ask me because, like, so my games run one of two ways. I either do paid games, where it's all about whatever the player is comfortable with. Like, you know, mm. if you've just paid me dollar dollar bill, y'all, I'm not going to be there. Like, nope, I will not continue playing until you use your correct character name. But likewise, you know, with home games and stuff like that. Once the game has gone on for like three or four sessions, I try to get people to, you know, use character names or interact a bit more in world. Yeah. For me, it's very much about like my player's comfort zone. Um, and I think, to be honest, that's kind of what it comes down to is just mm. finding that comfort zone and letting them know, you know, look, you know, hey, do the thing. Just don't get too bent out of shape if you don't want to. Yeah. See, I'm kind of the person that, like, once I've got a feel for where someone's comfort zone is on this, I will try to, like, gently ease them out of it. Oh, yeah, I get you. I mean, that's the dream, isn't it? You know? Yeah. And I, I like to think that if I did the paid stuff, I'd probably be, I, I'd be very bad at it because I'd, uh, I'd probably be like, yeah, this is like a coaching thing. <laughs> yeah, we're going to make you into players. Yeah, well, that's the thing. Like, there is an element of that, like... I know a couple of guys who do paid for GMing that they are basically that they market themselves as kind of role-playing mm. coaches. Yeah. Um, but no, I think it's, I think if you genuinely want a player to start role-playing and the rest of the group is, and they're not make it seem fun. Like, Oh, I could fill a podcast with the number of cringy moments I've had where people have been quote unquote role playing and you've just got some poor guy sat at the table just going shut up 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 you know yeah i get you i i've definitely seen that happen mm. i mean i think some of it is you want you want it to be a something structured yeah you want to, you you don't want to just be in the tavern because things get like i think people work better like when they've got an idea of what they're supposed to be doing. Yeah, that, I mean, just being stuck in the tavern just leads to, I seduce the table, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, especially if they're, they're new and they're being pushed hard to do something, try to be, they often try to be funny as well, which is never funny. Well, it's a, it's a defensive reflex, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I'd also say little things like um, addressing people by character name mm -hmm. does really work. Yeah, and you know, encouraging people to use each other's character names does work as well because you know you don't have to make yeah. it like a hard and fast. I'll hit you with a stick rule, but it, it's nice. You know, it makes the players feel like you actually care yeah. that they decided to name their character. Yeah, little stand cards as well. I, I find they're really helpful. Well, that's quite cool actually. Like if you put just put the character name on it though. Hmm. Uh, actually, the weird thing is from Bands I I've got like lists of character names, and there's so many people that I didn't actually find out what their actual names are, yeah. just their character names. Yeah, but then I mean... again, they were they were all Norwegian names, so I couldn't pronounce <laughs> half of them anyway. <laughs> I'm sorry, I think I think you sneezed. No, that's my name. <laughs> to all the Norwegians uh... listening, this is me being nice. Remember. Um... <laughs> But no, yeah, just make it make them want to do it rather than forcing them to do it. Yeah, I think that's definitely the like the gentle option there is is definitely right. And once mm. they start having fun with it, then the, they they will start challenging themselves for it. Yeah, I think it kind of comes naturally. And um, there's a follow up question for that, which is, and what exact what accent is the GM actually trying to do? Oh. Um, so 
accents and like character voices, I think, is a, a nice little thing to discuss next in general. Yeah, all right, let's do this. So, I kind of like doing them, but I don't tend to go massively over the top, apart from for my major villains. Hmm. I I have okay. I won't say they're banned at my hmm. table, but they are heavily discouraged at my table. Yeah, because um, there's the the Space Marine voice, as I call it. The what? The Space Marine voice. Uh, so, okay. Yeah, brother, how are you, brother? And it's just <coughs> oh wow, it's just guys putting it on as deep a voice as they can to yell at each other when they're sat four feet apart. Mm. And it's like, it's that or it's the demon voice. Yeah. And they're like, I have come to steal your soul. And it's like, yeah, I, I, I don't trust this guy. Yeah. I mean, it can be really useful to try get the an NPC across really fast. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I if mean... If someone it... does the brother voice, like, the Space Marine voice, like the first meeting... And you're going to be talking for about like about three sentences. Um, that's when I'm like, yeah, I should probably do the voice here. Yeah. No, I mean, it is a useful tool. It's just not one I personally mm. use or am comfortable with using on the regular. Yeah. You know? I mean, I also find that I tend to do like the same four or five voices and it gets really annoying. That was, ex- that was exactly what I was going to say was like, you know, I I have my fallback voices that I do. Yeah. Because, well, let's be honest here, you know, quote unquote, in the real world, most people voices fall within a range, you know? Yeah. So if you have a really unique, quirky voice, people are going to remember it. And when you're supposed to be mm-hmm. like the, the top secret contact that's never been found out and no one even knows his face. And he's like, oh, Paul, I hope you'll have a great time, guys. It's like, well, just find the guy who talks like that. <laughs> you know, job done, mystery yeah. solved. Let's move on to the next episode, Scooby Doo. I'm trying to. I think I'd use them more if I felt I was better at them. Um, yeah, that's the other problem is that, like, Matt Mercer. Yeah, they've got, got professionals in there. Sexy, talented Matt Mercer. You know, he he's a professional. He does it. It's hashtag literally his day job. Yeah. And you know, I've had people, I've had people contact me asking, you know, about me running games for them and that lot. And it's not even been a question of like, hey, do you do character voices? It's basically just been like, I can't wait to hear your the character voice. voices. Yeah. And it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. No, 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 no. I'm a professional GM, not a professional get not a professional voice actor. Yeah. You know, I, I know my role. I know I know mm. where I sit on that acting spectrum. And it is not near that end. Yeah. I mean, I've um, been doing some improv classes, trying to do a bit more voice stuff in that. Um, mm. And I'm hoping that will transfer to the table. I'm uh, sure it will, man. I mean... Most of my stuff ends up transferring to the table at some point. Exactly. You know, and that's the other thing. Like, you you want to do it, whereas, you know, yeah, if, I'm, totally. if I'm blunt, it's not, it's not really... It's not something I want to pick up as part of my repertoire. You know, yeah. I'd much rather if someone said, no, I have to have character voices, you know, I'm, it's a mm. deal breaker for me. I'd be like, OK, well, have you considered asking Purple if he'll do it? Because yeah. you're not going to get it from me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know. Yeah. I mean, I think, though, I'm, that's one of the weird ones where I'm not trying to learn it for role playing purposes. I'm trying to learn it from like improv and acting purposes. Mm. Um, and like theatrical stuff, and then I'm gonna apply, I, but I know I can apply it back if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I get you, I get you. Yeah, you're yeah. learning it for kind of you're learning it for for useful reasons, and it happens <laughs> to enhance your hobby. Well, it's, I'm learning it for a different hobby, is probably the uh, yeah, okay, yeah, I'll give you that. Other reason, I, I, I don't have much uh theatrical stuff to do in my day job. <laughs> Yeah, well, we're, you know, if we were dragons, we would be hobby dragons, let's be honest here. Yeah, just collect them. Yeah. Right. Um, next oh, question? Yes. Um, from Maggie, is pissing off your GM so much he throws an orange at your face a mark of shame or triumph? See, I think there's this big thing of, like, players versus the GM that's been very unfortunately put forward especially i feel it was really strong in like D 3.5 
Pathfinder, yeah. like early Pathfinder stuff. When that when Pathfinder went as big as it did, it brought with it some of the worst, like some of the most annoying, like um, ah oh, cliches from D and D, like the tropes. Hmm. And what, often for that guy, yeah, they if all you've heard of are that guy stories, people start thinking that's kind of the norm. Yeah, I mean the I mean actually this is, this is good. This is a good point to interject with this thing. So, like, you know, one of my side hobbies is stand-up comedy. And yeah. quite often my my jokes are about things that have happened to me. And yeah. I have had people come up to me and they've been like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So you tell all these stories. like, So every night you go out is this absolute, like, oh, yeah, you go out and, like, you know, you get drunk and you try and steal the flag from the North Korean embassy. Yeah, every night you do that. And it's like, no, that's, like, one night out of hundreds. Hmm. Because it's not funny, me going, yeah, so I uh, went out in London, met with my mate Steve, we went to the local pub, you know, drank four or five pints, went back to his, ate some pizza, and yeah. then decided to call it a night. Like, that's not funny. That's not... That's not a stand-up set. <laughs> yeah, that's not a stand-up set. You know, that's me telling you about my weekend. It was fun, but... Yeah, it wasn't big, you know. I don't know you mate Steve, so it could yeah. be terrible. True. But, you know, that's the thing, like, you don't tell stories about the mundane sessions. Yeah. You, tell, you tell stories about the ones that go completely off the rails in one direction or the other. Mm. And usually they it's more likely to go badly than it is to go well. Yeah. Especially if you're learning. And also, for one thing, things going badly requires no context. Yeah, that's also true. Like the number like a story about something going tits up like requires you to tell how it went tits up. Everyone can see that it's going tits up. Yeah. Whereas talking about how you had this amazing payoff for like six months worth of really cool writing, you know, that, yeah. that requires you to know the writing. Well, like, I, my proudest moment in Dungeons and Dragons, oh, you know, in role playing, I can't tell anyone really because it would literally require me to tell you the plot of a campaign um, that we ran for, geez, uh, it was 28 months yeah. playing weekly. So I'd have to tell you the entire plot of that for the yeah. the single action my character took that was the payoff for all yeah. of that time. There's no one's going to listen to that. No. Now in the comments, there'll be someone going, oh, I would. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> that a podcast <laughs> just starts at the beginning. <laughs> yeah, right. So. <laughs> See how long it is compared to the actual campaign. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, um, the other thing, actually, this this touches on a thing I have. Um, so antagonizing the GM seems to be like almost a hobby of people. Yeah. And it does annoy me because it's like the, the best the best way I can put it is like, you know, when I were a lad and I first got on the Internet, trolling was like clever. Yeah. Well, it wasn't. There was still lots of horrible trolling, but like the stuff you saw and heard about was like there was a fantastic one where a guy um so there was a guy who was the moderator of quite a popular message board yeah and he had a really weird last name and um he was like really really proud that he'd hunted down like every person with that last name yeah and you know he knew everyone with that last name and he knew the origins of it and he knew you know he knew everything about some guy just made an account joined the forum and he only ever made one post and it was just him going like, hey, dude, um, heard about you. You know, I heard you've been looking for everyone with the same last name as you. That's awesome. My last name is, you know, Fickenbar or whatever it was as well. Yeah. And this dude just lost his goddamn mind and just like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of posts of him like putting genealogy charts up and all of this lot proving that this guy couldn't possibly have the same last name uh, and all this and like dude just melted down like that is a, a good bit of trolling yeah, yeah exactly but then it became like it just became like you know you're a homo yeah and it's like oh i mean at the end of the day every like, the gm is a player as well yeah. And you're all there to have fun, or in your case, to get paid. That's slightly different. Yeah. But the idea is that it's a game that you're all playing. Exactly. And if I if I do actually throw an orange at a player, that is probably the triumph bit. That means it's gone yeah. right. 
I mean, it's it is a lot to do with context. It's like when you yeah. tell it's like when you tell a truly grown worthy joke. Yeah, like that's know. how it'd be with me. Like otherwise, I would probably just stop the game. Yeah. If I was gonna, if I was almost like gonna throw something in anger, I would have stopped the game like a responsible adult. Yeah, and gone. You yeah, know. no, not cool. This is not cool. Yeah. Oh, in the same vein, like uh, how like Pauline asks, how much fire is too much fire? In the same way, I think it's a similar sort of like a player hijinks thing, you know? Yeah, I did have a like so. I had a player who wanted to play a character that was a like a free form spellcaster. Oh, cool! And um, their whole thing was, I mean, I, you know, I thought, okay, that's kind of cool. Like, so I made it that their things had to be in balance. So you know, like they had to put push forces in the correct directions and all this lot. And because they were like from a physics background, they had quite a good brain for it. Yeah. And they had to choose their like so I said like if there's ever overspill, so you know, if you use if you're not balanced, what's your backlash effect? And they were like, uh stuff catches fire. And I thought, okay, mm. that's cool. So just stuff around you catches fire. Yeah, things just start to spontaneously combust. Okay, cool. So everything's going wrong, everything's going wrong, things are catching fire, they're panicking and using more spells and more spells yeah. and more spells, and more and more stuff is catching fire. And then one of the players just yells across the table at them, for Christ's sake, what you're doing right now is, oh God, everything's on fire. I know what I'll do. I'll set the things that aren't on fire on fire. Then I only have one problem to deal with. Oh, man. <laughs> but like, yeah, this touches on, like you said, the player hijinks thing. Like, like uh, Player okay. hijinks are fun, generally. And I think that's like one of the nice things. You can end up with a plan that is basically let's set everything on fire. Yeah. And you can quite legitimately do that. And it'll be a cool story. But then again, like going on the next, onto the, quickly onto the next question. So I think it's kind of related, you know, when it starts to become beyond a joke. Yeah, so the the uh, next question is from Sean, and is it is it still chaotic to sell your fellow players into sexual servitude for profit? Um, so I like player hijinks, quote unquote. I kind of have a problem with because, mm. like, so one from my personal games, it winds me up because, like, I don't know, I don't know if if you've hung out with me enough to to notice it, but like, I am always busy. Yeah, like I am literally always busy purple can tell you how much of a nightmare it is to book me to actually like be on the podcast oh yeah yeah and like so i have a very limited amount of social time and i've decided to spend it with these people yeah and they have asked me to run a game for them and i have used you know my valuable social time that i could spend with my partner or learning something new or improving myself or whatever and they're dicking about yeah. And they're not even creatively dicking about. They're just dicking about. And it, it annoys me. Mm. Likewise, on the flip side, I get people pay me to run games. So they have exchanged money with me to run a game for them. And then they dick about. And mm. I'm like, okay, guys, you're on a clock. Like, you know, like you yeah. get, the deal is you get three hours of actual play. Yeah. So if you, if you piss about, then you're, you know, you're just burning time. Mm. And then the session will end and they'll have done nothing because all they did was dicked about and they'll get pissy with me. Yeah. And obviously, like, because it's a service that I'm providing, I can't tell them to go kill themselves. So I've got to just stand there basically and be like, ha, 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 ha. That's really funny. Like, you know, maybe you should keep your eye on the prize a bit more. Ha, 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 ha. me with that. Like, are there any sort of player driving techniques that you've kind of come across doing the paid stuff that you might not have seen otherwise? I'm a big fan of putting players on the spot. Yeah, I find that really works. Yeah, so it's like um, countdowns. I love countdowns. Yeah, dropping a threat in as well, like in, like so narratively and you know out of character. Yeah, I mean, I I do, I also do it like visually. I hold my fingers up. Ah, right. So when someone is you know kind of prevaricating or trying to take you know 15 minutes to plan out what their character does in six seconds, yeah, I just hold my fingers up and I'm like five four three and they don't know what's going to happen when i hit one yeah and quite often that snaps them out of that kind of mm. panic loop um the yeah. other one is just flat out reminding them mm. that it's costing them money 
Yeah, I think my regular players have kind of got used to it. If I go, right then, that means get moving. Yeah. That means I want an answer to what you're doing, and I want it quick. Yeah. Well, I, the other thing is, is like I can calculate to the I can calculate to the minute how much it's costing them. Yeah. And so normally, what happens is like groups do not pay as a group. There's usually one guy who drops the bulk of the cash on the game because he's the guy that really, really wants to play, and the other guys get to play with them. You know. And yeah. I have had a game where the no one was doing anything, basically. Everyone was just messing about. And I just, because it was over Discord, I just quietly PM the guy who was paying for everything a number. And he was like, what's that? And I'm like, that's how much money this, um, this literal, the, the characters were having a literal dick waving contest. Yeah. And I was like, that's how much this oh, has cost man. you. This, that's how much this has cost you. And the guy was immediately. This is what your penis has cost you today. <laughs> well, not even yours. You know, this is what your friend's fictional penises have cost you. And that immediately got him back on got back on task. And he was like, no, guys, you know, we're big damn heroes. Put it away. Let's do this. And yeah, I mean, I've had people say to me that, eh, you know, it takes the fun out of role playing. I don't want to be on a clock. Then don't don't hire me. <laughs> do it with your mates and spend six hours deciding whose character has the longest schlong. But then that is quite cynical, you know? So on a slightly like lighter note, mm -hmm. is how many encounters is the bard allowed to seduce their way out of? And I think that's a, a lot more of a fun way of putting these things. It is a plan. It is like an approach. It's also an approach that doesn't include the other players too much. Yeah. I mean, my big thing is that actions have consequences. Yeah. And the problem is, is that usually the player who is playing the bard that wants to seduce their way out of everything is the like that's their go-to thing. They're a one-trick yeah. pony, and it it just becomes train wrecky, you know. Yeah, I find like it can be really fun, like to have a character whose thing is that, but it's one. It's going to get boring to the other players, mm. and two, it's going to get boring to the GM. Yeah, I mean, um, I've I've kind of de re troped it, kind of. Okay, where I had a player who just wanted to seduce their way through everything. Yeah, and I went, and I was like, okay, cool. Um, you know, like, okay, the thing is, is that you are going to be known as someone who attempts to seduce everyone. Yeah, so people are going to react to you differently. You know, there's consequences for your actions. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, but then again, that's a big thing in all of my games is, mm. you know, actions carry consequences. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think you're also very right in that it's a very single-player-centric, you know, it's quite a selfish way of doing things. Yeah. So I, also, I tend to run a lot of one-shots, so, like, the, you don't get the bonus of you now have an interesting NPC. Yeah which often you can turn it into that. You'd be like, yeah, um, yeah. now this this character has changed. Like We, we can add them back in later. Mm. But you can't really do it in a one-shot in the same way. Yeah, I did. So I have a character. So I don't get to play very often. So no, generally... do I. Yeah, I know. So generally, when I get to play, I have like a pool of characters that I, yeah. just, I kind of dust off and update them to whatever system we're playing. <laughs> and I have a character I dearly, dearly love, and I'm sure that there's a couple of people listening who are going to groan when I say his name. But um, he is Hernandez, Master of the Blade. And yeah. think, think Puss in Boots. Like, you know, yeah. the ridiculous... I, so, okay. I got, you, you were saying about character voices, but I got a lot from that character voice. Y yeah, yeah. But I can like, imagine the, the hand action you probably did there. Yeah, I, I normally stamp and clap as well, but... Um, yeah. Yeah. And but you know he he's a ridiculous character. He's you know the, your classic stupid swashbuckler. Um, he's kind of he's my beer and pretzels character, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, my proudest moment role playing as him. Uh, he gets caught with the um, Duchess in you know in the room. Uh, he is completely starkers and he's about to jump off the balcony because he can easily survive it. Yeah. Um, so the GM says, right, you can grab one item. 
So I have my family's heirloom, always sharp, you know, amazing sword, which is my, my birthright and destiny. <laughs> and I have the cheap guitar that he played to seduce the Duchess. Guess which one I grabbed? I am guessing... I, I don't know. I, I, I was thinking this was going to go for, like, I've got a parachute down on the Duchess's dress. No, 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 no. I grabbed the yeah. guitar. Yeah. So my character, so Hernandez kind of turns up completely starkers running away and, yeah. the group, and the group's running away as well and we we get to safety but we're in a really dodgy part of town yeah so then um so then it's like ah there's a fight and they're like okay hernandez you know to the front and i'm like uh guys yeah <laughs> and, but yeah and so my kind of quote-unquote best moment of the whole you know playing the womanizing i seduce everyone character was um we rescued a princess from a dragon yeah and um the the GM was quite good about like fade to black type stuff. So yeah. Hernandez uh, seduces the princess. Uh, mm. Fast forward to the next morning, Hernandez comes down and uh, sits down at the table. You know, puts his boots up on the table. And he's like, uh, "Gentlemen, I'm sorry to inform you all that uh, we may have some problems returning the princess." And the group's like, "Why is that?" And he's like, "Aha, she is uh, no longer a virgin anymore." And then the group kind of points out the princess, who's look, sitting there looking shocked eating her breakfast and i'm like and hernandez is like what yeah dude she's been with us like the whole morning <laughs> and then he kind of there's this like moment or two of silence and then hernandez is like i must leave because obviously the dragon shapeshifted uh beautiful so i will admit and this makes me a horrible player but the gm i made it up to the gm in the future but then we proceed to completely derail the campaign as the campaign then becomes Hernandez attempting to escape from the dragon that he got pregnant and uh, his and his half dragon child. The thing <laughs> is, right? Like, if the rest of the players are having fun with it and yeah. the GM's capable of doing it, like, if if someone did that to me in a one shot, I I could roll with it because it, but I'd, the rules would be terrible, you know. Yeah, I yeah, have yeah. no idea where I was going. It'd be really stressful, but like. In a longer campaign where I kind of got to know the group and the characters and stuff like that, I, I you know, I could see making that work. Yeah, and I mean, it it ended with um, Hernandez getting married. Yeah, you know, oh, that's nice. It's like, well, it was more the, it's like, well, it's not a shotgun wedding because they don't have shotguns. Is it a crossbow wedding? Like, <laughs> I mean, there's flaming breath. I mean, that's uh, yeah, exactly. Well, that was the thing. thing. Like, yeah, it was like cause, so Hernandez' last action, like my last scene with him, because I had to leave the group. Um, was like, you know, Hernandez is walking down the aisle, you know, the music's playing and all of that lot, you know, you can see the group there, what do you do? And I'm like, his last thing was like, my friends, please, you know, together we can still save me from this situation. And it's like, so the group, what do you do? I was like, oh, we're all crying. We're like, oh, it's so beautiful. I can't believe you yeah, found true beautiful. love. It's like, no, my friends, please, please. Like, Oh, that's good. Yeah, that's just a dumb thing, but like, but that was a very specific circumstance, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, like, so yeah, if you're willing to accept the, if you're willing to accept the consequences for your actions, potentially all of them. Until it stops being fun. Yeah. Right. So the next one um, from Mark. If you could add a favorite homebrew race to a standard D&D &D book for others to enjoy, what would it be? Oh, hmm. See, I don't do a lot of D&D &D homebrew races. I don't do a lot of D&D &D homebrew that's not encounters. Yeah, like, true. That's pretty much the only thing that I actually do homebrew for is um, mm. to make monsters. Yeah, actually, since since like fourth, I haven't yeah. really done much. I haven't really done much like race rules homebrewing since three point five. I mean, like, Pathfinder. Pathfinder had the race builder thing, but it was crap. Uh, so yeah, uh, it was actually. I can't yeah. think of one that I built with it that I would think of as a favorite. I mean, I did bobbage together like some half undead thing for a player who was dead and they they didn't know how to re like, resurrect him properly. That's quite but cool. That was uh, uh, that was kind of fun. Uh, it was sort of like a bot. It, it, it downstated like his casting stat and stuff. Mm. But it, the idea was that it was basically holding him together until they could get him somewhere, you know, de like a decent where they could actually resurrect him yeah 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 you know find the material components for raised dead basically yeah um 
Hmm. So I don't really have one like that's a homebrew race. If I could port a race, though, I think it would be... Um, I really love the octopus from Eclipse Phase. <laughs> yeah, the cephalopod uplift. Yeah, they are absolutely amazing and just so much fun to play. Yeah. Um, though, a lot of the really cool characteristics, like, um, you know, the sort of ambush predatory, sort of um, not really getting people, you know, the endless patience, that kind of thing. Mm. They've already done that with the lizard men, which is really nice. Yeah. Like the lizard man from Volos is very, very good. And really I've got, fun a, I've play. got a player playing as one, and he's really getting into yeah. doing the whole like, you know, okay, what does your character do? Well, I've been told to wait here. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna wait here. And then what? Well, when the guy comes past that I'm supposed to be waiting for, I'm gonna rip his head off because that's, that's what, what I've I been do. told to do. And it's remarkably effective because most quote unquote normal people don't expect someone to sit outside their house for 15 hours. <laughs> yeah i mean i like when i played one it was just not getting jokes and stuff like that like mm. not to a really ob like ob like um where it was obstructing the game yeah but like someone goes yeah in your dreams and like the, the like the elizabeth just looks at them and goes what are dreams yeah and the rest of the party just step back and went, what how how do you not get this I, get I, is it something I, i'm supposed to be given like that kind of thing yeah kind of uh, and, drax esque yeah but also like the whole idea of how they like think about fear and stuff like that mm. it's like it's not that they feel afraid it's that they are pursuing an action because something might damage them yeah if you get me it's like a respect it's an awareness of the world yeah and it is an emotion in all but name but it's kind of like how it, it was really fun to play mm. I had a character. We played a high level game when I was at uni. Yeah, and I'm, I was like level. I think we we're level twenty two, level twenty three. Mm. So like ridiculously high level, three point five. And I just monster mashed myself together a um, half dragon, but I was half everything. So I had half immune, everything. Pretty much, I was a half every flavor of dragon I could find. Oh but man! I had because they remember half dragons had immunity to yeah. So I had immunity to every damage type. Um, and then I was like a monk and I didn't need to breathe and I didn't need to eat and I didn't need to sleep. And I, you know, oh, I could resist crushing pressures and all of this lot. So I made this character that was basically, you know, like I was, okay, put it this way, level 22. And my character is effectively a level two monk <laughs> in terms uh, of like class levels, you know? Yeah. So, um, so we all make these characters and then it was like freaky friday we all got we got body swapped oh god and my character so end... okay. what level person did ended up with your body <laughs> oh level 22 the idea was the group we ended up getting body swapped so my character ended up in my friend vicky's um like female sexy sultry um dervish who like you know yeah. i can i can seduce or stab my way out of everything and it yeah. was one of the most fun roleplay experiences I had because the whole thing was my character was like, like, Vicky, 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 what? There's something wrong with your body. What do you mean? What's wrong with it? I, I don't know. Like, you, 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 your stomach, it feels weird. Am I, am I hungry? Are you what? Am I hungry? Do I need to eat? What? You know, oh, that's brilliant! But then it was like I, you know, once my character got kind of used to the body, I just used to piss and moan about how weak it was. Yeah, and like, eh, 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 you know, I can't resist crushing pressure. And I have to breathe air eh, eh, and all of this lot. And I was like, and I lost my tail, and you know, all I've got to make up with it, make up for it is this pocket, and <laughs> everyone at the table suddenly goes silent and looks at me, and I'm like. <laughs> and they're like, please, please, please. And like Vicky was one of those people that used to make characters she like fell in love with. And she just covers her eyes with her hands. And she's like, no, do not. No, no, do not describe this. Do not do this, Molly. <laughs> yeah, that was, a, that was a fun character. 
Yeah, I, I didn't know if you'd swapped class levels or not. I, oh, no, no, we fully but... swapped bodies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and because the whole idea was that, like, you know, we'd been we'd been in an adventuring group that had adventured together for, like, hundreds and hundreds of years. So the last time my character had eaten was, like, 600 years ago. So he'd forgotten. Yeah, yeah. Just what completely like. Fun. Yeah. I, you know, I haven't slept in basically forever. Yeah. You know, I I don't know how this works. Like. Your mm. body is crap. I hate this. Um, so, like, quite alien characters, then, you think? Yeah, they're... yeah. But, yeah, sorry. Um, oh, a race. It's a really tough one. Um, for silliness, I would have to go with Eclipse Phase. Uh, the space whales. You know, the solar whales? Oh, yeah, the Sue, yeah. They're great. Yeah, just pew. We'll just chill out. So in the we're going to put in um, two races um, from Eclipse Phase and get rid of halflings. Oh, I dislike halflings. Bonnie plays short races, so I am required as to keep them in. Yeah, because remember, oh. you can't spell gnome without no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's a really tough question. Yeah. Right? Genuinely, a really tough question because a lot of my homebrew races are very setting specific. Yeah, hmm. and I did quite like the Warforged from Everon as well. Yeah, the um, I think that the Ashari, the Ashanti from Sandstorm from three point five, the like desert elves that could swim through sand. They were I quite think cool. I know which ones you mean? Yeah, they were quite cool. But the problem was yeah. that. They were broken because if you're in a desert environment, you suddenly have three dimensional movement when everyone else yeah. is stuck with, yeah. Three dimensional movement that blocks line of sight as well. Exactly. Um, whereas everyone else is stuck with two dimensional movement. And yeah, it, 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 it's very unbalanced. Um, yeah. But no, that's a very good question. I get the feeling that that is going to be a question that derails a lot of future episodes of Roll on the Adventure. Yeah, like, could we use this race in something else? <laughs> oh, I, I would totally use my one from Primordia. Or one of my ones from Primordia. The big what floating was? rocks. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, that could work. That could singers. Work. Yeah. But I need I need someone to play my bard. Like, right, the well, one that translates. Anyway, so, yeah, yeah. We're, we're in danger of spending a lot longer on this question than all of the others. Yeah, well, well done. I think, Mark, I think you may have that may be the best question so far. Yeah. Yeah, wow. I, I, I really enjoyed that one. Mm. Um, Martin asks, um, are there far less RPGs published now than there were 20 years ago? And I think that if we're talking in like terms of physical publishing of books, I think that 20 years ago, probably less. What would that be? 1998? Yeah. But that's kind. Is that where? Where's that in D and D terms? And that's OGL before. That's, before yeah. three point five. That's yeah. That that's is before the, OGL, isn't it? Yeah, that's the death spiral of second edition. Yeah. So there was still quite a bit of stuff being published. It's also like when some of the like, you know GURPS and that were still. Yeah, GURPS, well, GURPS is still around and that. Lot, but um, vamp, I think it, yeah. But that would be first or second edition of Vampire. Uh, give me one second. First, um, Empire, the Masquerade, Vampire the Masquerade, released in 1991. So, uh, do, do, do. yeah, so they're, st they're still kicking off a lot of the setting stuff of that. Yeah, you'd have had like Call of Cthulhu, Rune Quest. Yeah. You know, Shad so a lot of splats. Yeah, I think, I mean, I can tell you honestly in terms of statistics. Yeah. No, like in terms yeah. of, in terms of publishing, there has never been more being published. Oh, ever. yeah. And you I know. think the, that's because of the barrier to entry. I think what it, it might look like that because there's been a change in like distribution models and stuff. Mm. Oh, there are fewer shops that all cook. There are fewer shops covering like a lot of different ones i think mm. there's there's more that are kind of sort of bunkering down on one or two systems yeah i think the other thing was that um the other thing was back then back then um there was less i don't want to say freedom but like rpgs were much more factionalized yeah you know it was like like I just I played D and D, yeah. That was it, you know, because 
my GM didn't run anything but D and D. Yeah. You know, there you go. Them's your lot. It's the days before, like a lot of these quick starts and things like that as well. Yeah, and like, you know, the other thing was as well that um, role playing. I don't know if this is just me with you know very heavily rose tinted glasses on, but back then role playing felt very different. Like it was much more for me at least like party and objective based there was less kind of there was less character development no i i, I get you yeah. i this is a bit before i really i started on it because i started in like the like early 2000s yeah and it's like you know and it was like hey you've got you know you are a group you're a bunch of big damn heroes you're doing heroic mm. things it was much more about like you know you you as a group will go and retrieve the star of Erebeth. Hmm. And a lot less about, you know, oh, you know, Gwendolyn, you know, your master comes to you and says, you must retrieve the Star of Erebeth. Get the group to help you out. You know, it was. Yeah. Th that might just be like the group I was playing in or, you know. I think like 3.5 very much sold itself as a system you could role play in. Hmm. If you get me. Um, because it was trying to get some like traction back from vampire and storyteller scene. Yeah. So I think that's kind of probably to do with that. They stopped pushing that as hard. So new GMs who are picking it up wouldn't necessarily know about that, like the uh, sort of murder hobo style, you know? True, true, yeah. Um, I've got a whole rant, I mean, and it's a long one, about how I felt role-playing changed, but that's just me being an old fart. Maybe you can prod me into doing it at some point, but I'm tired right now. I think we did if we've got enough time for it in this episode. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But um, yeah, I mean, one thing, ironically, I think 3.5 helped with was it created kind of like a fatigue because, you know, there was that one point, there was that point in the early mm. 2000s where everything was OGL. Oh, God, yeah. You know, the problem is most of it was crap. <laughs> yeah, 90% of everything is terrible. Amen, brother. You know, like... I mean, though, I suppose with the Pathfinder OGL stuff, it just got even worse because there was even less barrier to entry. Yeah. At least with the D and D OGL stuff in the early two thousands, you had to convince someone to print it. True, but yeah, I mean, you know, but you had like all this OGL stuff, and that was actually when a lot of my friends who were diehard D and D players started looking at storyteller, and you know, mm. because they were like, all there is is just this crappy, you know, churn and burn mm. knockoff OGL stuff. Like we want something a bit realer. You know, we want something a bit meatier. Yeah. Like, also, like, the power creep in OGL stuff. Like, <laughs> you, you've got books selling themselves of the most powerful classes. Well, there was the, was it the Eternals handbook with the, um, with the... The Immortals handbook, yeah. With, with the um, golem. The, Neutronium you know, golem. The Neutronium golem, that's it, yeah. 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 One of my friends did the maths on how to kill that thing and not like, you know, yeah. one of the stupid like omnisifier pun pun types things as in. Yeah. Yeah. Like just going up to it and kicking its head in. And it's like physically to roll that many dice would take hours. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not the like, do, have you seen the Necroverse? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which is like someone something someone created using the templates for it, which is like an undead universe that hates you. Yeah, and when <laughs> it dies, it causes a big bang. And like regenerates itself. Yeah, yeah. and all that lot. Yeah, it's really dumb. Really, really yeah. dumb. I mean, I, I think the 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 powers in that, they were intended to be really stupid. Yeah, I mean that that book kind of came out swinging being dumb, but like yeah. Dragon Mech. I don't know if you ever saw that. I've heard the name, but I've never read it. So the idea was it was like, uh, you know, holy crap, giant robots, basically. Yeah. Um, and it had stuff in there that was like, um, oh, yeah, characters at starting level can get electric flamethrowers. Don't know how you get an electric flamethrower, but okay. Um, that do 11d4 damage every round. That's that's just asking for someone to have their feet destroyed getting out up from the table. Yeah. And it's like, that's, that's an, but that's like a level one. That's the baseline level one oh, level man. of power. But yes, yeah. but yeah, um, in answer to that question, statistically more, many, 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 yeah. many, many more in real terms, uh, still more. 
Yeah, I think with the like the one page of sort of indie scene, there's a lot of cool stuff out there. Oh, there's some amazing stuff out there. Yeah, but um, it's also you can't. You, it's hard to sell a one page game in your shop, so you wouldn't see it. You know? Yeah, exactly. Cool. Anyway, um, uh, yes. so we should be moving on quickly. Yep, from Martin again. Uh, are custom face dice a well designed storytelling tool or just a cash grab? Um, I particularly the new Star Wars with the Fantasy Flight dice. They are a well-designed storytelling tool. I, I do really like them, yeah. I I actually use them in my personal homebrew campaign. We use mm. them for like when we're doing kind of soft skill stuff. So oh, like nice. It, yeah, yeah, because it, it's really nice. Like rather than it just being like a, a set pass fail, it's yeah. like a fail forwards type thing. Yeah, the fail forwards element to them is what makes them good, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of people that dislike them because of the fail forwards thing. But, See, you know, I really like fail forward. It's kind of my go to thing. Like mm -hmm. any skill check should not leave things the same. True, true. I dislike the fail forward. By the way, for those of you who don't know, fail forwards is the idea of if you fail a roll, stuff still happens. It just may yeah. not be the stuff you want, but it will generally move the story forwards in a way that's mm. quote unquote useful to you. Mm. Um. You saw yeah. the GM, definitely. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like the fail forwardsiness as written in the book is quite poorly described. So yeah. a lot of new players view it as, oh, well, I can't ever lose. And it's ah. like, no, no, you can. It's just you don't lose so badly that the game becomes unplayable. You know, you can't soft yeah. lock the game. I mean, yeah, you can't just be stuck. You can't just break the lock and nothing happen. Exactly. You can, you can break the lock and the guards are coming, which gives you a different problem. Yeah. You know, you can have a like one of these horrendous failures. Or you could fail with a triumph. So it's like, oh, yeah. Uh, but um, you can hear the guards talking and you realize that one of them is that guy you talked to in the bar earlier. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite ones, um, picking a lock completely completely failed i mean like you know yeah five failures and six threat and um i was saying like okay so you're trying to pick the lock and it's really really difficult and you're fiddling around and you're fiddling around and you you know you just time's going it's getting really really nervous and it doesn't seem whatever you do you can't quite seem to get the lock to move yeah um, so you know you step back for a moment and the guard on the other side of the door finishes turning his key that's that's changed the situation though and that's yeah really it has good. changed it, but it's the idea of like you know you still succeed the door is still open but now you have been discovered yeah and not only that but you've also been fannying around for like 10 minutes yeah while the guard is just stood there like R really really like let, let guys let's no no don't don't like don't get your guns out yet i like, get your guns out but like don't kick the door in just yet i want to yeah. see how long he tries to keep picking the lock for like i do like the way that picking a lock becomes like one of the canonical actions for this partly because it's handled so badly so often oh god yeah like i would hate to do a lock picking scene without no like i well i'd hate to do some of the early lock picking scenes i did again um where i didn't know about fail forwards yeah or hacking yeah fail forward is fantastic for hacking yeah um unfortunately it still causes the problem of it is one player playing one game while the rest of the players mm. wait but pff, we'll ignore it's, that. it's better than than mm. just having them just sit there and roll and roll and roll mm. but yeah um i think they're really good purple you clearly think they're good as well but i think we both think they're good because they facilitate a style of play that we mm. both get on with yeah like you because of the fail forward nature of it the gm has to be pretty good good at improving yeah if you want to see a bad version of fail forwards the new warhammer 40,000 role playing game wrath and glory all right i've not looked at it so as written and I understand readers written, blah, 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 blah. But as written, um, the fail forward is so strong, it is basically impossible for players to fail. Their roles what? always have a positive outcome. It's just that like the, the, the dice that they roll informs the GM how positive the outcome is. What? How positive? That's a bizarre set of wording. Yeah, I know. It's, it's really badly written. 
really especially for warhammer where things going horribly like almost you want to you want to succeed backwards with warhammer yeah yeah you yeah you want to you want to you want to yeah you want to succeed backwards i like that yeah yeah like, you want a yeah you want a yes but yeah well i mean um someone described it as the step on me mommy system uh like you like i'm not i'm not playing warhammer fantasy role play because i want things to go well like you know yeah that's I, that's a but, silly idea <laughs> Yeah, the gag is in. I am fully expecting on getting hurt. In fact, that's why I paid admission. You know. Yeah. But you know. Okay, I think we've we've got a f only a few minutes of, like to get through a couple of questions. So um, this one. Um, so Mike says he's been spoiled by by fourth edition and the simplicity of building combats in it. I uh, and he's really enjoyed running that. Uh, but finds 5th edition uh, a lot less DM-friendly. Uh, what tips do you have for finding fun, well-written monsters and for balancing encounters? And I can really empathize with this one. I ran quite a lot of 5th um, edition. And, at uh, Bands Icon. At Bands Icon, yeah. I ran like 14 hours worth of it. And uh, that's more than doubled what I'd run before. Mm. <laughs> and I found the CR ratings particularly bad, for D even for D&D. &D. <laughs> Yeah, the fifth edition does suffer from like action economy, where like because the players can do more with their actions, they can beat monsters a lot easier. Or occasionally just can't. Like um, the animated armors that I threw against my party, they were level mm. three. Two, uh, there was two of the animated armors, um, like four players, I think, maybe five, and it, they were just not hitting. I had um. Luckily, I'm pretty good at down like static restarting on the fly. Yeah, um, yeah. So I had to I had to downstart the race just to have the players be doing anything. Yeah. Um. So for me, there's the there's the two sides to it because like there's if it's paid game, balancing encounters is something I spend a lot of time on. Like yeah. a lot of time on. Um. And it's kind of some kind of weird mental alchemy. I can't really describe yeah. the process to you because. It just happens, you know. It's a lot of experience, but from just playing fun games, a lot of my like, well, particularly in doing like convention games and stuff like that, um, a lot of my monsters are just they they will survive X number of hits, you know. So like um, the big wibbly monster at the end of my D and D intro adventure yeah. is designed to survive about eight hits, and if you yeah. crit a crit counts as two or three, you know, okay. so actually it doesn't matter how much the players beat on it or, you know, how long the combat goes on for. It's not, I'm not giving them hit dice. I'm giving them hits. I kind of get you. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it gives the players the feeling of agency because they're like, yeah, yeah. You know, we kicked the crap out of that thing. Like that fight took like 10 rounds. That was amazing. And actually it didn't take 10 rounds. It took, 50 hits yeah i kind of get you yeah um but that can horribly backfire especially you... if you've got like you know utility like players and stuff like that yeah you know? or you give the monster utility yeah that's and then true. It, and then it kicks the players you know it kicks the players feet out their ears it just um there's no easy tip i'm really sorry to say that particularly in fifth edition they've i mean if you go by the strictly by the fifth edition guidelines they're not bad, hmm. but it's still that hurdle to get over of learning all those guidelines. Yes, yeah, a bit of an ask to eyeball, because wood monster encounters are actually relatively rare, aren't they? Yeah, because yeah, you, it just becomes a, a player stomp. You know, yeah. your players will always win a one a but one. The problem one is all the numbers are based around the idea that this is going to be a single monster. Mm. And I think that was a pretty pretty bad call for them. Yeah, I'd like to see more like what the Thirteenth Age did, where they had a like you had a level and a type, so mm. you could have a um, a monster that was a level six monster, and it's a level six monster, but it's a, it's a like a double strength monster. Yeah, so it's still defeatable by a level six party, and it's designed to be a fun encounter for a level six party, but it's also like nice and nice and chunky. Mm. You know, the other one actually, this can help. Don't neglect terrain. 
Oh like, yeah. Don't imagine that you're fighting on. So like goblins. Uh, well, there's Tucker's kobolds is the classic example, but mm. um, you know, goblins fighting in their homes are not just going to suicide run at players unless they have a yeah. reason. They they're going to dodge around. They're going to use the terrain. They're going to you mm. know, they're going to have tricks and things to use. That can help a lot because you're suddenly suddenly it's not just the players punching the thing till it dies. It's the players reacting to problems while trying to punch the thing until it dies. Mm. I, I do like the players reacting to problems. I think that's a really nice way of putting it. Mm. Um, because you've also like you can do a lot with that. Yeah, I you mean you, you can go too far, but like with anything, you can go too far. The other one is, I would say that some of the most fun ones I had at Bandai Con were either where the players like get to influence the sort of lead up to the battle a bit. Mm. They they've got a chance to come up with a plan, you know, put like get a little bit of an advantage by doing certain things that can add a lot of fun. Mm. Because even if they curb stomp it, they'll really enjoy curb stomping it. Yeah, because they sat there and they were like, okay, yeah. we know it's weak to this, so let's set this up and let's flank yeah, over yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, they, they killed the vampire moose. It almost murdered them, but they managed to like get it into a, po- a point where they could curb stomp it. And yeah. they enjoyed it so much. Um, um, I think the other one is have objectives that aren't kill the monsters. Yeah, that's always a good one. Um, oh, sometimes the players will forget it. Uh, they were fighting a shambling mound to try to get a magical mushroom. Um, completely forgot about the mushroom and decided to focus on fighting the mound, and it it nearly killed a bunch of them because mm. <laughs> they they didn't need to kill it. Yeah. Um, and I think that maybe if your players are having trouble, remind them of this that they have the option of leaving the monsters to deal with later. Or, you know, possibly causing other problems. I think having that choice to break off, or even having the monsters break off, yeah, can be kind of fun. Like, remember what people's objectives are, give them kind of interesting ones. Yeah, yeah, that works, that works. Yeah. Um, I think that's about all we've got time for in this part. Yep. Um, so, I think we should do Sean's question next. Uh yeah, can do, but as our one to like leave in the break. Um yeah. yeah, Jessica asked, uh, what is the craziest of crazy stories of a party in one of your campaigns, the most ridiculously bizarre slash funny situation they ended up in, and how did you handle it? Um okay. so we will give our kind of quick and they are sadly gonna have to be quick answers to this, because I dare say the pair of us could fill up a podcast with just dumb Stupid player stories. stories. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. Uh, Yeah. Um, See you after the break. Bye. Bye Bye-bye.